Well, good morning, everybody. Glad to see you all here this morning. It's been a great week this week. I know we've had our, our battles, and, and it just seems like the enemy has been on our shoulders quite a bit. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your presence in our lives. We know that sometimes we open that door, and, or he just pushes right through it, Lord. But we just ask you for that hedge of protection around us, around us as a congregation, around us as families, as, as a village, Lord, and just as your people. We just ask you for that strength and power to endure through those trials and those temptations when Satan puts us through them, Lord. And we look to you for guidance in our lives. And we do this all with, our, with praise and worship of who you are and what you do and what you have done for us, Lord. We do it in the name of our living, our Savior, our living Savior, and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We read this morning from the book of Romans, chapter 1. Paul a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Regarding his son, who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. reminder, uh, we do have uh, Corn Fest this year, uh, Sanctus Real will be playing on Thursday night at 6 o'clock, uh, Australian uh, contemporary Christian artist, uh, popular back in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, they, but they play some really great stuff, they do a lot of great worship songs, uh, especially the classic contemporary song, the classic old contemporary songs. <laughs> We're getting to that point where when contemporary Christian music now has, can actually have an oldie station, which is something that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, anyway, we do have some prayers this morning. Oh, uh, also, lest I forget, uh, don't forget also, the third weekend in August is Latham's uh, sesquicentennial song. I know a really great artist is going to be there selling her paintings, so come on in and check it out. Uh, that's not the only reason why, but, you know, call it a selfless plug. Uh, prayers this morning. Uh, we're, we're asking for prayers for Bentley on his baptism this morning. Uh, that's where Chris and Dave are, are headed off to right now. We also ask uh, for prayers from the random shootings, this is from Lucretia, from the random, random shootings that are going on in our world, uh, that God will be able to restore America. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's funny that Lucretia would bring that to our attention this morning, because that's exactly what I was thinking when I chose that first song. Um, I've been asked why... I don't support certain regulations. And I keep telling people because we don't have a problem with those devices, those tools, if you will. The problem is God, or a lack of God in this world, a lack of respect and compassion for other people in this world. So we need more Jesus. And we have to, you know, the question when will we see that? 
hopefully we will see that very soon. Uh, Nancy is having a great time in Indiana. She got there safely, uh, so let's pray for her safe return. Uh, coming back on that. Um, let's see here. Carl's, Carl has a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Uh, so we pray that he gets the news that he wants to have from that um, and be able to move forward. Hopefully, you know, continue his healing that he's going through and God willing, get off of that oxygen and get his energy uh, back that he's lost so much of. Uh, praise that Tabitha's wrist is healing good. Tabitha's mom uh, will see a hand surgeon uh, tomorrow, uh, something that Dennis and I are very familiar with. She's got a trigger finger, uh, so she's going in for, for that consultation and probably scheduling that surgery very soon. Uh, uh, Deb said, Phyllis Raleigh, uh, prayers for help. Roby. Roby? Roby, okay. I can't read Chris's handwriting. Uh, uh, Gary has asked uh, for prayer, a tumor on his kidney to be out biopsy um, and so we've had prayers that that biopsy will come back negative uh, for anything um, and also another praise report Blanche is finally out of the neck collar mm -hmm. praise the Lord for that I know how much that was just driving her insane uh, does anybody else have any other prayers that they would like to add to this list this morning or praises all right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Heavenly Father, we lift all of these prayers up to you. Gary and Phyllis and Carl and uh, Bentley, a congratulatory prayer for Bentley on making this decision to be baptized. Uh, and a welcome prayer, uh, welcoming, welcoming him into the family, I guess, officially, if you will, Lord. But we lift these prayers up to you, Lord, that, that uh, your hand will be on them that healing will take place for those that are hurting, that the doctors will be surprised by tests that come back and, and what they were expecting to find isn't there or is not what they were thinking it might be, Lord, and that it's actually something that is good because your healing hand touched that life and took what was potentially bad away, Lord. We know that all healing comes through you, Lord, so we lift these people and on the subject of healing, our nation is, is hurting, Lord. It's in so much pain. People have, have turned to violence to try and quench their pain, trying to satisfy their own selfish hunger to find something that is right when it's right before their eyes. All they have to do is reach out and say, Lord, I need help. I need you. Help get me through this situation. Help me to see what is right in this world. Help me to be your hands and feet. The love that you provided us. Help me to give that to this world, Lord. Because we know that without you, without Jesus in our lives, this country will continue to fall into the depths and the hands of of our enemy, Satan, Lord. We just pray for all those who are having these thoughts, Lord, that to commit violence, to have violence be their, their mode of operation, Lord, that they will see the truth and that your children, who have already seen that, will, will stand up and speak out that in faith, miracles can happen. We just want to see our country, our people restored to the love that they've always had for each other and to the greatness and leadership that it's always shown the world, Lord. So we pray not just for the people, but for the leaders, that they will see that they need you, that they will hear your voice and follow your direction in this world, Lord. And we will make a comeback to you, a, a, another restoration that we've seen happen so many times in this nation, Lord. 
We lift our nation up to you, Lord, from the top down to the lowest, Lord, that they will turn to you and turn to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And we offer this prayer to you in his name, Jesus. during the announcements. Um, I would like to take up a special collection next week. Uh, the purpose of this collection is to help pay for um, the advertisement for Sanctus Wheel on WBGL. Um, I would like to, to provide that for the committee. committee um, having missed the last couple of years and whatnot, donorship is down. And so I would like, if everybody could just, like, an extra $10 uh, next week for a special collection. Um, if you do, just write on the bottom of that corn fest so that we know what that's for, so that when we uh, put it into the account, we know that that's what that went to, and, and uh, so we can get the check and get that all sent off to WBGO uh, after service next week. I would greatly appreciate your assistance with this as with the community and the community. So, all right, that's it. Back to service. Are we on? Okay. Good morning, once again, to all of you sitting here, those of you who are joining us online, it's wonderful to have you all here. Um, it's just been a great week, a great series that we've been through as it's challenged us to Excuse me, step out of our comfort zone and, and reaching out to people we don't normally reach out to, inviting them into our homes and or just out to dinner. Um, and it's just been a wonderful time. Um, it's, it's been enlightening for me, and I hope it's been enlightening for you in meeting some of those challenges as well. So we're on to our third head, listen and learn. You know, I think we've all been in these situations, either at work or maybe we were daydreaming back in school and we're, you know, sitting there and somebody asks us a question or asks us to do something and we haven't got a clue what's going on. We don't know how to do what they're asking us to do and we have no idea the answer to that question. That's a very unnerving thing. Not being prepared for such things, and it's probably the reason so many people are to struggle with the idea of evangelism. Is we don't know what to do. We we know what we don't want people to do for us, but we don't know what to do when we bring it to other people. Which was kind of the whole purpose of this this series, surprising the world, is doing it in a unique way. Kind of a, a passive, yeah, I don't know if you call it passive aggressive, but just a passive way of living out the grace and mercy of God so that people ask that question. Oops. No. Um, you know, and we don't all have to worry about that in your face, convicting type of evangelism. You know, we've been talking these weeks, and we have this, these two different roads that we can travel for evangelism. Um, you know, there's the one less traveled, which is the one most of us travel as the common believer. Um, and then there's the harder road to travel. That's the great, the, the great evangelists, uh, and Peter, and Paul, and, and all those that have preceded us and been before us, and they travel more and take, took it to the world. But this only works if we stay on our path, we, if we follow that road, and we continue to live that life of, of Christ and present Christ to people with the way we live, the same way he presented himself to the people in Israel, in Jerusalem, and, and Caesarea, and, and Galilee, uh, that they, they wanted to know what was going on. And so, 
we have this this lesson here today. Um, it started with a story. I don't know, maybe you've heard this, but it's a story about a pastor who was teaching a group of young kids. I'm not sure why you would preface this as a group of young kids, because it's been my experience when a pastor asks a question about something. And he's looking for that semi-theological answer to it, or getting to it, that kind of answer. Everybody kind of like sits there and goes, hmm, I know the answer, but I'm not going to say it just yet. Anyway, he asked a question of this group of kids. You guys have ever watched one of those furry little animals in the tree? What kind of animal is that? That's exactly what he got. It was silence. He said, you know, they, they eat nuts, and they're gray, they got a big bushy tail. Anybody? Anybody? And so he goes through like three or four different descriptions of trying to get the kids to tell them what this is. So finally, one of the little boys looks up at him and sees the pastor's face, and he's just like, come on, guys. And the kid raises his hand, and he says, yes, Jimmy. He said, well... I think you're talking about a squirrel, but I know the answer is really Jesus. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, and that's, there's so many times we get into that situation where we know what the answer is, but we're afraid to give it. Because we might be wrong, or we might not have the right answer. But that's where today's reading comes into play. Okay, we're called not, as you said, the main title on the side is don't preach the gospel. But that's what we're called to do. We're called to preach the gospel. And that idea scares us. It scares us as speakers. It scares us as listeners. When somebody comes up and starts talking to you unexpectedly, even those of us who are believers, about Jesus. We're like, okay, here we go. Where is this nutcase going to go with it? I, I, I hate to say that, but that's often what happens. People think of us as nutcases. And that's not what we're on. But there's been so many people that have tried to ramrod the gospel into people that they don't know what to do. So we preach. The idea of preaching... I'm looking at the wrong spot in my notes here, Joe. But anyway, back to what I was starting with. Today's reading. We're going to look at Romans, specifically the last four verses, two through six. Um, and Paul, in this verse, this is actually a condensed version of a 30 verse section in Acts when Paul was presenting the gospel to a group of uh, Jewish believers. And you'll notice in here, the, the areas that I've got highlighted in purple were the, are the main points of, of that longer speech that he gave. And we look at it, and he's telling, this is the story of Jesus' life. One, he's a descendant of David. Two, he has been anointed through the Holy Spirit. He is the Son of of God, as well as the Son of Man. He was resurrected, which is what gives him all of his authority through God and the Holy Spirit. And this person is none other than Jesus Christ of Nazareth, born of the Virgin Mary, who was married to Joseph the Carpenter. And it's through him through this Jesus that we receive our grace. And notice this little word right there. Uh, one, two, three, fourth one from the bottom, bottom, fourth word in. Apostleship. He's sitting there going, we receive grace and apostleship. That we is not specific to his team. That we is specific to us. All of us as believers. To call the Gentiles. 
whom we are also among. We are called to call. He starts out here identifying himself in verse 1 as a, uh, as a uniquely called and qualified speaker of the gospel. And then goes on to give this Cliff Notes version, which is the story of Jesus. The story of who he is and what he did and what he left for us to do. It's a recount, or a, 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 a shortened autobiography that was found, is found in Acts chapter 13, which, as I said, he gave to the Israelites. And in that version of it, he actually starts out with the Old Testament, how it points to Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God. And then closes it with this section in a little more detail, so that the Gentiles and the Israelites can understand how all of that pointed to this moment, to this man who we now speak of. Notice what he doesn't do in this. He's not preaching the law. This is not a list of thou shalt nots. He's not accusing anybody of being a sinner. He's not rambling on about the, the legalistic and, and accus being accusatory or judgmental. But he is setting the table to present to them the life of Jesus Christ and how it fulfills everything that Everything that he taught. Oops. There we go. Skip the slide. And that brings us to his letter to Timothy, who is one of his. I hate to use the word disciples, um, but comes out of Paul's teaching tree. He was one of Paul's students. Um, and he says, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus. That he was raised from the dead. <laughs> that he descended from David. Because this is the gospel. The Old Testament reference to David. God promised Israel that he would set a person on the throne permanently who comes out of the line of David, their great king. Jesus is that person. Not only did he do that, but then the New Testament reference that he was raised from the dead. Jesus resurrected just three weeks ago on Easter Sunday. To sit on that throne next to God and rule over the heavens and earth. To rule over death and provide us with that, that new Passover that I talked about a few weeks ago. No preaching the law, no stepping on toes, just the story of Jesus. A promised descendant the physical presence of God's kingdom here, right now. Not that obscure place of heaven, but right here on earth. And that it's through Jesus we get all of these opportunities and offerings and the blessings of the kingdom of God. And we have that faith that produces. And we hold on to that faith and follow through on the demands of the kingdom. And that through his death 
and a resurrection. All, all who have faith in him will find their own atonement. That they will be restored as God intended us to be. Cleansed and pure. Able to stand before God on our own and not have somebody work in between. So rather than preach the gospel, all we do is tell them about Jesus. Who he was, where he came from. And it's our questionable life that opens the door for that. So if we're going to tell them about Jesus, we have to know the stories. We have to know them so that they just simply come out when somebody asks us about our life. When we're hosting those dinner parties for the poor, or as some people think, wasting our money when we give the panhandler on the corner five bucks. Why we give up vacation time to go on mission trips or to work in disaster relief projects. We continue with last week's lesson of blessing through the table and through the meal. We need to marinate ourselves in the gospel. You know what happens when you marinate a piece of a piece of meat? You soak it in that the, the fluid and the spices. Even a dry rub gives you a little bit of that marinade kind of flavor. It, but it soaks into the meat. It fills it so that the meat is tastes the same all the way through. And you get this wonderful, delicious flavor out of it. We need to marinate ourselves so that flavor comes out of us at a moment's notice. The minute somebody goes, yeah, why? Okay, that's like that minute you take that steak knife and you slice it through that nice tender piece of T-bone, you want to take that piece of meat, stick it in your mouth, and go, oh. We want that same reaction from people when we tell them the story of Jesus. We want them to go, oh, man, that's what I had no idea. This is so great. In Scripture, is where we find the gospel specifically, those four books at the beginning of the New Testament, are where we find that story to learn. You see, it's not about sin. It's not about telling people about their sin. Because I'll be honest with you, I, there is not a single person sitting in here or watching online right now that can look at could could look at Jesus Jesus and say I have not done anything wrong. That, that we we are not able as as scripture the story of, the, of scripture where the Pharisees bring that woman to Jesus and he's drawing the sand and he says, well, let whoever is without sin cast the first stone. Not me. I don't know of anybody other than Jesus that could claim that. But Paul, when he would go in and tell about the gospel, excuse me, he wouldn't start out with their sins. He wouldn't start out with the social structure of the community. He'd focus on Jesus and his role as David's descendant and king of God's kingdom. So when we are asked about our faith, why are you the way you are? It's not about sin. It's not about guilt. But it's always 
about Jesus. And making them, alerting them to the eternal work, the eternal reign, the universal reign of God. David Bosch quoted as saying, the mission of God's people is to alert, not to convict, to alert others to the universal reign of God. Our words may have convicting power, but that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to give them the story of Jesus, the gospel. And to produce real change, I said this earlier this morning, to produce real change change in this world, the answer is always Jesus. We need to return. We need to come to Jesus. You know, to, to quote that often misused phrase, he had a come to Jesus moment. That's what we need. We need everybody to come to Jesus. We need to quit asking the question we sang this morning, when will the world come to Jesus and start taking Jesus to the world? The passage from Acts referred to earlier from verses 38 to 39, it says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. A justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. So you can see here, this is at the end of those verses that I referred to earlier. He didn't start out talking about their sin. Anybody who's run a business or been in charge of something, when you're in charge, what's the one thing that people always want to do? They want to tell you that there's this problem or that problem. I, I think just about every boss I've ever had, the first words out of their mouth when you start complaining, do you have a solution? All started out with the solution. Jesus. You need to have Jesus in your life. Jesus is what gives you that opportunity to have that blessing. Your faith in him produces that blessing. And here, after he's presented that, after he's given him the solution, he addresses the sin. Not calling them Sinners, but telling them that through Jesus, who I just told you about, who provides that Passover, that repentance, that redemption, all sins are forgiven for all who place their faith. All. Pan is the Greek word that we use for panacea or pandemic. That we all have become so familiar with the last three years. All encompassing the whole globe. Not just a select few. The answer is always Jesus. And the story always ends in justification through faith. Because of who Jesus is as the Son. And what he did in taking away our sins in his death and rising from the dead to be seated at the right hand of God, overcoming death so that we can have eternal life. Through faith. Evangelism is not about the church. One of the first series I did five years ago, 
I set out to get us to take a, take the gospel out to the, to the public. Um, and I said at that time, I would love to reach 10% of the Mount that Mount Zion. Sorry about that. The Warrensburg Latham School District with the gospel. Not bring 10% into this church, but reach them with the gospel. You know, too often churches fall into that our church trap. Talking about how great we are. How loving the people are. Which is all good. Don't get me wrong. We need, we need people to know about how compassionate and loving and what we do for the community. But it's not about the church. It's about Jesus. I, mean, I think we've got a phenomenal congregation here. And I don't think anybody would argue with me on that. But we have to be careful to not get caught up in that trap. The other thing is with this is we often feel like we end up having to defend the church. That's big C church. Not us. Not our little church here. Although there may be times when we have to do that if something happens. Because the church has done, quite honestly, too many bad things in the name of God that really weren't the mission of God. They didn't show grace and mercy and love. The Crusades are one that comes to mind. Still in the news today, unfortunately, are the continuation of all these abuse scandals across different denominations. You know, it started out in one, predominantly now. I don't think there's a denomination in America that has not seen an abuse scandal going on. Our ministry is to pe point people to Jesus through his story. The good news is about God. What he wants from his children, what he does through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in overcoming evil, bringing forgiveness, and defeating death. There can be a new order in this world, but it can't happen if the world is not told about Jesus. Our job. Our role in that two-road approach to evangelism is to simply tell that story. Our purpose. We all have one. Both as people and as a church. And it's not to go to church. Although we do need to go to church. Being in church provides us with that fellowship and that community that... <coughs> Excuse me, the community that we need. But our purpose is to join God in the redemption, the repair, and the renewal of this world. Through the story. We've been reading along in our book that goes along with this series. Our author provided us a story one time. He was speaking at a conference in Australia, and he asked, he was actually at a conference that was specifically for Christian surfers. Um, and by the sounds of it, this was a really large conference. But he asked in one of his talks, who is your favorite surfer? And the room exploded with names. But the one that he heard the most and, and, and the loudest was a young man from Florida called Kerry Slater. I kept, excuse me, Kelly Slater. 11 time world champ, youngest at 20, the oldest at 39 to be a world champion. The crowd knew every single detail about his life. Hometown, 
the boards that he used, the years he won the title, the key trick that secured that title for him, the movies he's been in, women he's dated, all of that stuff and more. Frost was astounded by the enthusiasm that the crowd showed towards Mr. Slater. You know, we all have heroes in our lives. We all grew up with somebody that we looked up to and, and liked the surfers, whether it was a baseball player, a teacher, a, an officer, you know, a fireman. But we could tell you details about their life, who they were, what they did. But the reality is, can you answer this question? What do you know about Jesus? Can you answer that question as quickly as you can answer a question about Ty Cobb or Lou Gehrig, Ryan Sandberg, Ozzie Smith, Tom Cruise, Kanye West, the Kardashians. I can't answer a single question about that one. Can you provide those kinds of details? His hometown, his parents, his lineage, what he did for his living, how he died, how he looked. We should be able to speak about Jesus the way we do about our heroes. The way those young men and women at that conference did about Kelly Slater. We need to speak of Jesus with an energy and enthusiasm that is infectious. That people will understand that we're not living by a set of rules, but, we're, but that we're living through faith in glory. Through a faith that produces that reverence and that awe that says, I know that I'm where I'm at because I'm in the hands of God. And even if that point at this very moment is a position of being on the bottom of the, of the bowl of cherry pits, you know that God is going to reach his hand in and he's going to lift you up and all those pits are going to fall away. And he's going to hold you up above him and say, I love you. Continue. Go on. But it's also with a delight and a wonder because you don't know what God has around the next corner for you. God has a way of bringing you into situations you don't expect and, glor and, and giving you that opportunity to glorify him. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, we're going to talk about it next week, but I'll go ahead and use it today too, is Matthew 5, 16. Which tells us that our lives should bring the light to the people so that they will glorify God. So that they will have that awe and wonder and enthusiasm for God just like you do. Heavenly Father, it is so hard sometimes to speak about you. But it's through Scripture, through knowing you, through learning about you, that we come to know you, that we know your story, Lord. Give us that wisdom and that strength to tell your story, to step out when we're asked that question. When that door gets open to step through it and to boldly claim who you are as David's son, God's son, the anointed one, carried by the Holy Spirit and empowered through that same spirit to do the work and the will of our Father, our Creator, God. 
Lord, we just pray for that same spirit and that same divine intervention to be able to tell that story of who you are, what you did, and what you continue to do in the lives of us and the people around us, Lord. We lift this prayer up with, with thanksgiving for what you've done and a hope for what you will continue to do in, through, and around us. And it's in your holy name, Jesus, that we pray. I hope you all have a good week this week. Don't remember what the weather's supposed to be. I haven't looked at it yet, so whatever it is, enjoy it.